So just to give you a little bit of background about NCCOR, um, how many of you know about the training and technical assistance system in Head Start? So, so a, couple of, a couple of you. So we are one of six national centers. There's a national center on health, national center on teaching quality and learning, program management, early Head Start, parent family engagement, and we are the cultural and linguistic responsiveness center. So our job is to create resources for Head Start programs across the United States or anyone else who would like to access them um, to provide Head Start staff and their, com and their community partners resources to build their cultural responsiveness. We also infuse culturally responsive concepts and research into the other national centers. Um, and so we are sort of the go-to on culture and language. And about three years ago, we got a call from the Office of Refugee Resettlement and um, BRICS, which was Bridging Refugee Youth and Children's Services, um, requested that we work to, we actually it was a mutual request, but we work together to provide mo better access for refugee f children and families in Head Start. So we began to partner together to think about what, how we could do that and sort of what resources the community would need to make sure that Head Start teachers were prepared for new um, communities and families in their program. So today, um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, Head Start and refugee resettlement and what the benefits are for collaboration. We're gonna be sharing with you some resources that we've developed that um, are available free on our website that you can download. Um, and we're also going to share some new pilot site research. We're very, very excited. We actually, um, had qualitative and quantitative research based on the resources that we made, and we're gonna be sharing those res results um, that really highlight the perspectives of families and providers and Head Start staff. So sort of think about what the barriers are and what solutions are, and so that they can be promising practices and model programs for other Head Starts in the community. And then finally, we'll have a chance to do an experiential exercise where you'll be able to see our resources, um, engage in some of the activities that we've developed and then think about how you may or may not use these resources when you go back to your prospective cities. Thanks, Jarima, and it's wonderful to hear about the varied backgrounds here and just to let you know we just got back from um, the LA area and we're working with Mixtecos, uh, one of the Mexican indigenous groups on the same kind of collaboration there. So. Um, that will be next. <laughs> so I just wanted to make sure that, you know, we all have the background information. And I'm starting with who are refugees. It sounds like a number of you are working with refugees now. Um, <clears throat> and I'll talk about the U.S. program because one of the things that we have worked to do is really start at the federal level with the Office of Head Start and the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which are both under the Department of Health and Human Services. And the first challenge has been getting them to work together. <laughs> and then we go down to the regional and state levels and then the local agency levels. So um, it's been an interesting um, journey, <laughs> I'll say. Um, so for those of you who may know less about refugees, um, this came out of the Geneva Convention, of course, after World War II. Um, it is a very structured program. It's an international um, humanitarian program. So the United Nations High on High Commissioner, uh, United Nations High Commissioner on Refugees. Um, and then for the US, the Department of Homeland Security, Department of State, and then um, Department of Health and Human Services and Office of Refugee Resettlement are, are all involved. <laughs> and um, so they are admitted to this country based on a well-founded fear of persecution, and this is a very complex legal definition. Um, and one of the big changes in the U.S. has been when the program started in earnest in the mid-'70s, um, with the fall of Saigon, it was mainly Vietnamese, um, some Cambodians, and um, Soviet Union 
refugees. So since then, starting about the early 90s, refugees are now coming from over 70 countries. And the largest representations now are from Iraq, um, Burma, the Bhutanese coming out of Nepal, where they've been in refugee camps for many years, um, Somalia, the DRC, and then we're preparing now for Syrians um, to come in. The system is there are 49 states. We still wonder what happened to, to Wyoming. but. Uh, there are 49 states that have refugee resettlement programs and also 10 voluntary agencies and through their social services network are able to resettle refugees basically all over the US. Um, and one of the huge challenges, it's such a very specific service, it's um, about eight months of services. They can you know, provide a few more services at other times too, but it's very limited in scope. And then the refugees are to transfer to mainstream services. That can take years to happen, and especially when they're coming from very agrarian communities with little formal education often and, um, and languages that are not widely spoken. That can be quite a challenge. All of the refugees, because they come here with no resources whatsoever, are eligible for Head Start services, but the reason that we started this was that very few were accessing them. Okay, and those of you who know refugees well know the tremendous experiences and the refugee journey um, that they go through. Um, there's a lot of loss of traditional um, child caregivers, like extended family, um, health is often compromised, um, education is interrupted if they had access at all, and we talk a lot about um, trauma. At the same time, refugees have incredible strengths. So um, first of all, they have made it here. Um, and there's often, there's a strong emphasis on family and um, community and also education, and often the family. Um, we'll work together and everybody will, you know, they see education as the road to success here. And so they will pool all the resources and do what they can um, to help children succeed in school. Um, cultural differences, of course, and I know some of you um, are working on this in depth, but there really are, and we've talked about this at this conference, beliefs, different beliefs about how children develop and, and proper ways to, um, to raise a child. For example, working with Somalis, there was, um, they said, well, children really can't learn before age five, so why should we put them in early education? Um, and then also defining family. Family is defined differently across cultures. We've had several um, polygamous groups come in, and so we have you know, different mothers involved, and um, it, so it gets, it gets interesting and complex. Um, and how do you work with the community? Who has influence um, and how do we work with them? So, and then family engagement, of course, there are different beliefs about parental roles in school. And often um, in countries where refugees are coming from, it's, it's an issue of respect. It's the teacher's job to discipline the child, to teach the child in school. It's, um, and so the parents allow that, and so to tell them that they should be telling the teacher what to do or you know, should be engaged is um, a very different concept. Okay, and this is um, something that the NCCLR did, and that was merging the refugee data with um, where Head Start centers are. And refugees are literally all over the map. There's a dispersal policy, so they're in every community. And why should they collaborate? <laughs> so obviously, um, both programs serve diverse young children. And when we're talking about global changes and demographic changes in the US, refugees can bring a lot of culture and um, a lot of, anyway, you know, knowledge about their countries, about cultural diversity, different languages, which really helps children in this country um, get started in, in, um, in the right way. So refugee resettlement can provide the cultural and language expertise that helps Head Start agencies serve these um, diverse communities. Okay, and for refugee resettlement, the services, again, are so 
um, limited. And I heard somebody mention um, the school system or early childhood as a gateway, and so that's what Head Start can do for refugee resettlement. And they provide services to the families. So this could be ESL, job training, employment. Head Start can help orient refugees about the importance of early childhood development and how families engage in schools in this country. And Head Start can provide you know, the, the types of support that refugee families and children need um, to succeed. So I'll let um, Tarima talk about some of the tools that we've developed. So I'm going to actually pass I'm going to pass some of the tools, so I'm going to um, actually step off the podium. If you can move the slides, that would be great. Sure. So when we, started, when we started our collaboration, we did a lot of data seeking. So we had interviews and focus groups with Head Start programs, and we had interviews and focus groups with refugee resettlement, just to think about how we can enhance this, the systems, because there are two systems working in um, under human health and health and human services that haven't worked together before. So this partnership was the first time that the two people were talking. So during one of the refugee resettlement calls, it was clear that the res refugee resettlement folks really didn't understand about the comprehensive nature of Head Start. They knew that Head Start had a lot of waiting lists. <laughs> um, they knew that a lot, f a lot of children were um, who were eligible weren't being in Head Start, but they didn't really understand. So a very astute um, refugee resettlement um, provider said, well, why don't you make talking points so that we can learn about each other? And the same for Head Start. Head Start had no idea about refugee resettlement. So in order to promote that relationship, we, built, we um, wrote talking points. And it provides both um, systems background information so that when they're going in the partnership, they'll have a sense of the types of questions to ask. Sort of what do I need to know? Um, so if I'm a refugee resettlement person, I don't know there's a difference between half day and full day. I don't know about um, so the comprehensive services in terms of parenting classes and community partnerships and adult education classes. So Talking Points was a way to jumpstart that relationship um, so that uh, to inform each other about what the other has to offer. So that was the first publication. Um, next, we um, wrote, co-developed, and co-wrote four cultural backgrounders on the top refugees um, that were coming in the United States two years ago. Um, and so I have these here. And it was really key to us to have the ethnic-based organizations, to have the community leaders co-develop and co-write write these, um, these backgrounders. We were initially worried that people would take th this document and make generalizations or stereotypes about the families from different countries. Um, but then we realized that the Head, Head Start teachers had no idea what's, where's Bhutan. They had no context for why families were coming into this country. They had no context that I can't give the child jello. No, they're Muslim. They don't eat pork. There's pork and jello. So it's a little bit of background information so that staff and families could, staff and other Head Start partners could have a little bit of sense and context. Um, and at the same time, we um, created a handout to really promote getting to know families individually. So you have this context based on why refugee families are here. It's sort of the background knowledge. And now we want you to figure out, using that background knowledge, how you're going to know the unique characteristics of each family. What are some questions you can ask them in informal um, circumstances so that you can learn that information and then adapt program planning or reach out to community resources. So we really want to honor children and families' cultures, whether they're different. We really want to honor children and families' languages. They're gonna, they may be different, but we want to honor that and infuse it into Head Start, because Head Start's mission is to be culturally responsive. So it's a way of sharing information and also um, being open, really, to adapting services. Um, and actually, there was a school district that we talked to, and a lot of the children were absent for Ramadan, and they were the 
Head Start teachers and staff, uh, the staff couldn't understand why all these kids were absent, and they actually changed the um, attendance rules so it wouldn't um, look badly on their attendance records, which was a wonderful step towards being culturally responsive. Um, the next thing we did was we adapted a parenting handbook that Lynn and her group originally did for social welfare. And this, um, the original handbook was really to stop this um, floodgate of refugee families being um, in the court system because their practices were so different, oftentimes they didn't realize what the expectations were in the United States. And it was, it, the handbook originally was geared for school age uh, children and families. So because we're a head start, we created a handbook for zero to five. And it's not created for a how to, this is how you parent your child. It's really to start that conversation. These are the expectations a lot of US preschools and Head Starts have of children in different um, areas. And so this is a way to give families information so they have expectations and then build relationships and conversations based on their own parenting practices. So we were able to um, publish a few and translate them in Arabic and in Spanish. And it was the first Arabic publication on Head Start's website, so we were very, very excited about that. Uh, we have in draft form sort of a ways to use this parenting handbook because although it could be considered a standalone, we really wanted this to be based on ongoing conversation, using it in sections. We didn't want um, staff to say, here, this is how you parent your children. So we, so we created, and it's in draft form, a ways to use um, guide. And it really starts with staff's own self-reflection and self-awareness about their own beliefs, because oftentimes you may not realize that you're sending messages to families based on your own belief systems. So we, so we created um, many workshops to give staff opportunities to have those conversations, and then staff realized, oh, we all have different belief systems. Um, and so just because we're Head Start teachers doesn't mean we all think the same or have the same beliefs. And it's a way to sort of practice responding to someone with different differences and sort of practicing uh, um, understanding uh, what's, what's the benefit here, what's the goal here. It's not my way or your way that we all have different opinions and belief systems. Um, so that was part of this draft. And then to really honor Head Start's mission, part, in terms of parents being their first teachers. So we expect parents and staff to work alongside each other when they're presenting this information. So it's not Head Start staff teaching families, it's really a partnership. Especially with the refugee community, we recommend that there's always a refugee family parent in that workshop doing most of the talking and really leading the other newcomer families in those, in those conversations. And um, along with the handbook, we also de are developing tip sheets. And these, again, are very draft form, but we wanted to show you these tip sheets. It's also a way to have staff and parents think about conversation starters. So the first theme in the parenting handbook is prenatal care. It's very easy to say, take your prenatal vitamins, go to the doctor you know, once a month, and sort of give this prescriptive list of things that are expected in the United States. It it's, might not necessarily be the way that you're gonna build relationships with families. It's not necessarily gonna be the way that they may incorporate things or not, or have them think about different practices here. So these tip sheets are, are examples of acknowledging their own strengths and, and what they bring to the table, and at the same time, sharing the practices in the United States. So tell me about what it's like for women to be pregnant in your country. Tell me about the support. And then you build that relationship and you can provide examples of what other people's experiences are here. So those are the tip sheets. Um, the parenting handbooks can all be downloaded on our website. The talking points and the cultural backgrounders can be all um, downloaded on our website. And probably in a month or so, the first set of tip sheets will, will be downloaded. You'll be able to download.
interested. It's ECLKC. It's at the end of the PowerPoint. If you've signed in, you can email us and we can send you the PDFs directly or we can send you the website. We also have a lot of resources for what Head Start calls dual language learners. So um, quote unquote, um, for resources for children who are learning more than one language. So now Lynn will be talking about our two pilot sites, one in Phoenix and one in Syracuse. And we, um, they really serve to pilot and serve as promising practices for this collaboration between Refugee Resettlement and Head Start. They also provided a lot of feedback on our materials so that we wanted to make sure that real Head Start programs were using this and sort of what to change and what was didn't make sense. Um, so Lynn will be talking about the pilot sites and also the research that came out of that relationship. I'm a little more comfortable um, down here with everybody too, especially since we've got such a small group. <coughs> um, and this is very preliminary research, so we are really looking forward to your input and like getting the feds to work together and everybody else to work together. This has also been an adventure. Um, Okay, and we, we did choose two sites. One was Phoenix, Arizona, which we thought you may be familiar with some of the anti-immigrant sentiment there, and we thought if we can get this going in, in Phoenix, we can get it going anywhere. <laughs> um, it's also a high refugee immigration area. And then Syracuse, New York, which was you know in a very different place and a very different subculture, um, but also high immigration. So our goals were to identify local challenges and successful strategies for improving collaboration at the local level, to document and disseminate those lessons learned, and to develop recommendations to increase overall access to Head Start for refugee children. This was the bottom line goal for us. Um, and then also to review and co-pilot or co-develop and pilot and implement the resources that you were looking at. And it's so we've gotten feedback from the sites on this. Okay, and the main purpose, as um, Tarima mentioned, was to better understand the collaboration process from the perspectives of refugee resettlement and Head Start staff. So, you know, when we talk about pilot sites, people often think we're piloting an intervention and testing how effective it is was not. Um, in this case, it was more an exploratory qualitative study and we wanted to learn from the sites themselves. So um, what we did was choose sites that already had a strong interest and this was partly in the interest in, of time because it can take a long time to get people interested first. So we wanted to start with sites that were already doing this to a certain extent. Um, and these were two dynamic sites with, with individuals that were very motivated. Um, again, the geographic locations were, um, were quite different. And also, the collaboration process in Phoenix was led by the state refugee agency, so this means that they had access to all of the ethnic community-based organizations as well as the local refugee resettlement agencies. And in Syracuse, it was the collaboration process had been started and was being led by a local early Head Start Head Start agency, um, and they had already established a kind of a partnership with one of the small resettlement agencies. So what we did, and this this I think was one of the smartest things that we did, we offered them very small grants because we didn't have you know a huge budget, but we let them develop the process. So we didn't say, you know, this is what you're going to do, and that's often what funders will do, and lay out a process. So we said, tell us, you know, what is going to work for you to get the agencies working together. So um, this allowed them the flexibility to really respond to their local context and their local, um, and to use their local strengths. Okay. Um, and for the method, we started with site visits, on-site observation. We did a lot of key informant interviews. I mean, for the TA providers, we were still getting to know each other as well and learning about the different um, service systems, so we all had input. 
There were 33 exploratory in-depth interviews conducted. There were also about four focus groups um, with both service providers and refugee families. Um, semi-structured interviews with representatives and all of these roles. So we, we pretty much, we, we did a lot for, um, for a small budget. The interviews were audio recorded and transcribed, and then we've just started the analysis, so I've been buried in, in all of these transcripts, which has just been fascinating. So I'm actually hoping to, um, to get more input from folks here. Okay. And these are the themes that we've been pulling out, and one is there has to be a unified mandate. And it's always easy to say, okay, we're doing this for the kids. You know, everybody agrees we want the best for the kids. Um, but how that happens can be very, very different. The other challenge is getting buy-in from all the organizations at all the levels. So often you'll have, you know, an individual like in Syracuse, there's a woman, Maria, who has just been a dynamo, and she's the one who's got this going, and, She's an individual, but of course she moves on and it goes away. So um, for institutionalizing and for sustaining this kind of collaboration, you've really got to work at all levels. And of course, clear lines of communication. What we always hear first from people is, who do I call? <laughs> you know? How does your system work? How do we make referrals? And some of the resettlement agencies had said, um, that they knew about Head Start, and they had sent a few families and a couple of kids, but they didn't get in. So, you know, agencies give up after a while. But after the pilot project, they understood how Head Start worked, and so they were able to then send kids to the right place <laughs> and start to get families in. Okay, and of course the first step is always sharing information when you're doing collaboration. And it is amazing with the service systems how little they knew about each other. And um, so starting with sharing information, but also, um, as Maria said in, in Syracuse, it was just so nice to find somebody that she could talk to about refugees and about you know, the issues that the families were having that would have a different perspective and some resources and some information. So, um, so having someone, having some empathy there um, helped build those relationships. And there's the collaborative infrastructure and one of the you know, issues that came up to, especially in Phoenix, they really tried to work with agencies that were already doing this. So working with existing systems um, instead of you know, recreating working groups to, uh, there's a diversity group, and I'll get to that with the quotes, um, that was already in place, and refugee staff were going, were attending, so you get Head Start to attend. The refugee resettlement system has a refugee forum in, in every area, so if you can bring in some of the mainstream services like Head Start, then that helps increase communication and helps people to work together. Okay, so for the unified mandate, this really came up um, on both sides. We wanna make sure our refugee children and families get access to these very important services. And again, this speeds up the process um, for the families to, to move to mainstream services, to have access to healthcare, to have access to um, English as a second language classes, and even with help with employment, which of course refugee resettlement loves because that's the main emphasis. Clear lines of communication. So again, you know, the refugee walks in and they wanna know, are you a refugee? Are you an immigrant? How do I connect you? <laughs> Who do I call? Do I call these? Um, so clarifying all of this was very important during the, the pilot project period. Okay, and the first quote is from Refugee Resettlement and they're realizing that just Refugee 101, the basic stuff, is um, going to be so important. And also helping people with the cultural nuances. Um, and Head Start is realizing that they don't know much about these families and they want to. And again, here's an example of the diversity council that they were able to use as a vehicle for working together and for regular meetings. And 
then external, those were agency internal, external collaborative factors, resource allocation. As we all know, when we work with agencies, it takes time, right, to collaborate, and that's often not funded. It's not in our contracts, and we fall back to our contracts when we have you know, so much work to do. So we talked about a leap of faith with people really working together and using this extra time um, on collaboration. Um, policy and legislation that really shapes what people can do, and then institutionalization, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Okay, and again, you know, it's, it's something as simple as copying materials for trainings, it's getting things translated into multiple languages, it's hiring interpreters, all of these take extra parts of the budget, and they're not budgeted for, so um, this is one of the practical barriers. Policy and legislation, I love this um, quote, and I think we've probably all run into this, but um, this is Phoenix, Department of Education of Economic Security provides parents with childcare if they can prove that that person is working, but of course you need childcare in order to go to work, and so um, it uncovers a lot of the conflicting mandates. And then also the Department of Economic Security, which is what the state resettlement office is under, would talk about, um, these are our regulations, this is all we can do, this determines our resources, so we can't really do any more. And this person is saying that the ethnic community-based organizations and the parents and the agencies really can't, it can't be all up to them, it has to um, be from the state level. And then also, Head Start funding and services, we have to be careful with expectations because we say, okay, you know, you get free childcare, <laughs> you get all these services for your family, go to Head Start. And of course, it's not quite that easy. Um, so one of the things that we worked on, and I'll, I'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, or when I talk about what the pilot sites did. You know, the other, and again, this is resources for relationship building and maintenance after the pilot site period. How do they fund this continual working together? Um, how do we institutionalize these relationships and collaborations? Um, so these are some of the questions that we're still dealing with now, I think. Um, and again, the, yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, and again, the resources. Um, so what Phoenix did when we left it up to them, they contacted, this is the Refugee Resettlement Agency, they contacted the Head Start Center directors. They actually set up monthly cross-sector meetings for about the first year, and they talked about, you know, the, the first challenge was they knew nothing about each other, and they were even in the same building, they were even on the same floor. Never talked, never worked together. So it was getting to know each other, and then it was talking about, okay, what are the barriers to working together? What are the barriers um, to getting refugee kids into Head Start? Um, and then they, they came up with solutions together that made sense to both systems. And then they worked with the local agencies to implement these solutions, and one for the waiting list, if you get you know the resettlement folks all geared up to getting kids into uh, Head Start, and then there's a waiting list. They were able to add points for refugee eligibility. So that bumped up refugees um, much higher and got them in much quicker. They produced refugee recruitment videos in different refugee languages. Um, they provided cross-training, so refugee resettlement for Head Start, Head Start for resettlement about early childhood education. Um, and then they also came up with creative solutions for accessing interpretation and refugee resettlement agencies um, have to have staff that speak the languages and that know about the culture. So they, they can be a great um, resource. Transportation using the, the city bus. <laughs> so once you brought all these partners together, they were able to come up, they were able to pool resources and then come up with creative solutions. And the other issue, and this is an ongoing issue for us, is nowhere in the data system is there a checkbox for refugees. You know, so to get quantitative data, which we did next, and I'll talk about that briefly, was an incredible challenge. So
So um, what Phoenix did was to make a citywide intake form and they added refugee in a checkbox. I think you know they can probably do more on immigrants and, and expand that quite a bit, but at least this will give them more of a concrete way to measure refugee access. Syracuse put together two focus groups and they were already collaborating um, with Head Start refugee clients and um, Head Start providers. Again, they, they produced recruitment videos and I wish we had time to show you one of these. They actually turned out really well. Um, and then what I think was brilliant is they created an online database that enables sharing of case information on these refugee children and families so that the Head Start can access it, they can see what's being done for these families, what's not being done, um, and likewise for refugee resettlement, so it really enables them to work together on these specific cases, and nobody had done this before, so. And again, this was at the initiative and the idea of the site. Okay, and then what are the quantitative results? And frankly, I think that the results are gonna be much higher as time goes on because this process has really just started and we're just implementing um, these, these strategies. So we looked at the data period. We, we pulled data from 2008 to 2013 and there had been a steady increase of refugee enrollment in Head Start over that period. And then during the pilot site, because you remember we chose pilot sites that had, um, that were already doing a lot. But during the pilot site period, um, it, there was a jump up. So, for example, for Syracuse, it went from 1.8% of total enrollment to 8.9% of total enrollment for refugee children. And, and just an FYI, to get this data, there's no way to measure refugee, you know, who is a refugee. So we used language as a proxy, and we had language groups, and then we also matched that up with the refugee resettlement data, so we triangulated, as you say, <laughs> a number of different sources. And if we, if we use the, the data on language in a certain way, we got a very good reflection of the refugees. Okay, and this just gives you a sense of the increase of, of enrollment, so it makes us feel good. <laughs> okay, and then for Phoenix, again, showed trends of increasing enrollment of refugee children over those five years. And they went from 155 refugee language children to 325 refugee language children. And again, that bumped up. We're also looking at the refugee resettlement data for the sites. So that, um, for example, in Phoenix, there was a sudden decline of um, Burmese. And there was probably in 2011, so this was during the, the pilot site, but there's been a huge out-migration to Fort Wayne, Indiana of Burmese. <laughs> so anyway, we're looking at all of that in addition to the enrollment. So, and that's for Phoenix. Okay, so basically the qualitative um, study is providing us with a, we're, we're learning a tremendous amount from people on the ground and the strategies that they've developed that work for them. And so I you know our dilemma with creating a collaboration model is it has to it has to respond to the local context. So um, so as we continue to develop this, that will be one of our challenges. Um, and again the quantitative data show that refugee enrollment did in, indeed increase. And we're continuing to work together with the federal, at the federal level, with Office of Head Start and Office of Refugee Resettlement to continue to integrate this effort and to institutionalize. So um, it's very much a 